My name is Christine Zananti. I just want to thank you for watching this video today. Our hope at Victory Church is that these messages inspire you and challenge you and help you grow in God. So thanks for watching and I hope this really blesses you today. Well, it's awesome to be here with you today and uh, Merry Christmas. Thanks for spending your Sunday with us. Um, we have been working through a message series and uh, before I get into the message today, I gotta tell you, um, my, my husband and I and our family went on our first cruise uh, a week ago. How many of you have ever been on a cruise before? Wow, a lot of folks. I can see why people travel that way. It's cheaper, it's fun, it's all those things. So we went on a cruise together and it was a great time. And we had, a, um, some of the days you can go out and do what they call excursions, right? So we were looking through the website, looking through some brochures on some excursions that we could do for a day with our, with our uh, family once we got off the boat. And I think we have a picture of us there we are, the travelers, right? Here's our family, and we decided to go on a cave excursion, okay? So they, they, what they do is they take you, and I thought, you know, they just take you in a cave, show you some water and things like that, and we actually all got our picture taken there. Don't we all look great? You can't really see our faces, but our kids are smiling, and I look terrified. <laughs> Absolutely terrified because let me explain something to you, okay? When I read the website, I was in the impression or had the understanding that you could either walk through the cave or swim. I thought there was an option. Well, it was clear that when we got there, there is no option. The first thing they do is hand you your snorkel gear and then they tell you, go get into your bathing suit. And I'm panicked, okay, at this point. I'm like, wait, why do I need snorkel? I don't snorkel. But I go into the bathroom, get all ready to go, and then they sit you down and they explain, before we even go to the cave, they go through this debrief of how to swim in the cave and make sure you don't, you know, go off too far by yourself because a current could take you away and, you know, all of these things. So I am terrified. By the time we even get down, they walk you down into this dark cave, and there's a huge body of water. It's filled with water under the ground. Everybody's jumping in and absolutely loving it, like having a blast. And I was, of course, the last one. I'm standing there. I'm like, I think I can do this. I'm like touching it. The water's freezing. And my daughter comes over. She's like, come on, Mom. You can do this. You Come on. Let's go. So I get into the water, and we have life vests on, thank God, because you can't touch the bottom either. So you don't know how deep it is. It could go down for miles. And here I am, I'm like trying to stay above, you know, my head above the water. Everybody else is having a great time. Our tour guide starts swimming us into the cave. So now we're leaving the opening, and we're going into the cave where it's completely pitch black. There's nothing there except your little flashlight. And because there was so many of us, we had to share. So guess who took my flashlight? Yes, Pastor Lou. He had the flashlight. So I, I totally blew this. And the tour guide is there, and he's given explanation on all these stalagmites, or I don't even know what they're called, these things that fall from the ceiling, and how old the cave is, and the history of the cave. And I terrified standing there. I didn't pay attention to any of that. The only thing I kept thinking is, what is touching my legs? <laughs> what is touching my legs? Because I'm feeling stuff on my legs. Legitimately, there's fish in the water, in the cave. I don't even know how they live there. Like, what do they eat? So I'm, I'm in there, and I'm like worried about this. So we're swimming around, we're swimming, 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 and I'm just thinking to myself, this is not what I expected. This is not what I signed up for at all. And then finally, you know, the craziest part about this whole experience is that they tell you before you go in the cave, you're not allowed to scream. You're not allowed to make loud noises. You have to be respectful. This is some kind of Mayan thing or something, and, and you can't scream, you can't make loud noises, but mostly, not just out of respect, but because 10 feet above you are hundreds of bats in the cave, yes. And if you scream, they may fly around you and they may fly down. So it was the craziest experience, I'm telling you. It, it wasn't, you know, the, the funniest thing 
thing is, all of that wasn't in the brochure, you know? They don't tell you that. They just say, come dive here and experience a, a cave with water. You know, there are things in life that are not what you expect. How many of you have ever learned that? There's many things in life. We've been working through the message series, The Cradle, The Cross, The Crown. And we've been talking about the birth of Jesus and his life and purpose here on earth. Jesus didn't come as people expected. Even people reading the prophecies about his coming didn't understand fully the idea of this Savior that was coming into the world or God's plan. Last week, Pastor Lou was speaking about the cross and how this was not a plan B for God, but that Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. God, in, all, in his all-knowing power, chose to give his son as a sacrifice before he even created man. I mean, that's a powerful thought if you think about that. Today, we're going to talk about where we are today. See, the cradle is in the past. The cross is in the past, but today, Jesus wears a, cr a crown. He wears a crown. So let's turn to Philippians chapter 2. I've been fighting a cold, so you're going to have to forgive me. I'm going to need water breaks today. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2. Let's start at verse 6. Talking about Jesus, it says, Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I love the songs that we sung today. I don't think they even know, knew what we were preaching about today, but boy, those songs went perfect with what we're talking about. This Christmas season, let's consider who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? See, he's no longer this innocent baby lying in a manger, nor is he the suffering servant on the cross outside of Jerusalem. He is the King of glory, seated with God the Father, and everything in heaven and earth are under his power. That's who he is. Because of his obedience to the Father and being raised from the dead, he has received a title that is above every other title, the name above all names. See, the name Jesus was given to Christ before his birth, but the name above every name, on the other hand, was given to Jesus after his death. So when Paul said that Jesus was given the name above all names, he wasn't just talking about the specific name Jesus. There are many people who are named Jesus. How many of you know someone who's a Jesus? Yes. I have lots of friends who, who are named Jesus. And what he's implying here is the status and the authority that is granted to Jesus. His power and personhood exceeds all others. See, there's no comparison to them, to him. There is no equal. In other places in the Bible, Jesus is referred to in, in Revelation chapter 9 as the Word of God. In Revelation 19, he is called faithful and true. And in the Old Testament, he is called Yahweh, creator God, the God above all gods, the greatest of all the earth. Why was Jesus given this title, authority, name above all names? Well, in this world, there's been many wars that have been fought, right? Most for money, power, land, freedom. But it's 
it's usually the strongest army that wins, right? But Jesus fought the greatest battle that the world didn't even know he was fighting. It was an unseen battle for the souls of man, the destiny of the world. And Christ conquered the one enemy of the world since creation that no one has ever been able to defeat. Does anybody know what that is? Death. Death itself, absolutely. Death is the consequence of sin, and death is what sin deserves. There's nothing else in the world that's scarier than that. There's nothing else more dangerous, more threatening to your existence. You know, many of us struggle with uh, bad finances, maybe marital problems. You know, we have a hard time in this world. Difficult children, loneliness, depression. All of these attack us in our lifetime, but nothing is as threatening to your life as sin and death. Sin and death. And Jesus has defeated that. If he can defeat that, folks, then there is nothing in this world that is impossible for him to overcome. Death is, when we think about it, the most common thing about being in this world. It's as sure as our birth. It is. Every single one of us will face it. But death never really feels natural. It feels wrong. So we put huge effort into living we live this world as if it's never really going to happen. You know, we don't really think about it much, do we? We don't spend a lot of time thinking about eternity in mind. Maybe we should. In fact, the Bible says that we should do everything in light of eternity, where we spend our time, our treasure, our talents, the choices we make and don't make. These things should be done in light of our inevitable end in this world and the afterlife that is to come. Look around you right now. Look, look at your neighbor. Look how young they are. Aren't they young? Not really, right? Actually, we're all getting a little older every minute. We just don't want to admit it. Listen, whoever, whoever invents the anti-aging pill is going to be a trillionaire overnight. I just want to say that. There were some children touring a retirement home, and they were asked if they had any questions. Yes, one girl said, how old are you? I'm 98, the lady replied proudly. Well, clearly impressed, the child's eyes grew wide with wonder, and she said, did you start at one? She couldn't believe it. Children have a very hard concept. With, uh, it's a hard time realizing age and death and all of that. Listen, all of us will face death. It's as certain as our birth. And just because we don't want to think about it doesn't mean that it's actually not going to happen, that it's not coming. But Christ conquered death. So for a believer, you will leave this world and you will go directly to be with him. There's nothing that's going to swallow you into darkness. This Christmas, I want you to see the king who wears a crown. He has been given the name above every name, and every knee is going to bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the only one that has conquered the greatest enemy of our soul and won. He's won. Some people live as if Jesus is still in the cradle or on the cross. We live our life in defeat sometimes in depression. Sometimes you can't tell the difference between a Christian and an unbeliever. This shouldn't be, folks. Even in our worst situation, Christ is still Lord. And we can always praise him that he conquered death, that we are going to be with him in the future for the good that is to come. In this world, Jesus said, you will have troubles, but fear not, for I have overcome the world. Let's look at the name above every name and see the benefits that Jesus' life can give us. Because Jesus came, let's read the first one together. Salvation in the name of Jesus. Acts 4.12, salvation is found in no one else. 
For there is no other name under heaven given to man by which we must be saved. Salvation is found in Christ, folks. The second benefit that we have is to pray in the name of Jesus. John 14, 14, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. When you pray in the name of Jesus, you have the authority of the king. You have the authority of the one who is over all to do and to help and to be there for you. The third thing is we have healing in the name of Jesus. Mark 16, in my name, they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Believe in God for healing over our bodies in this world. Number four, freedom over sin and death. First Corinthians says, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death is not going to touch you. You're going to be directly with him. And then the last one is that we have authority over the darkness of de devils and demons. Mark 16, 17, in my name, they will cast out demons. Folks, Christ is... Christ's name has so many benefits. His victory is our victory. And these benefits are for everyone who believes in the name of Jesus. This Christmas, forget about Santa, okay? Forget about Santa Claus. There is nothing that he can give you that Jesus hasn't already provided. And so much more. Yes. There was a father, and he tells a story of his daughters, with that when they were little, they would always, um, he would gather them around the Christmas tree and say, today we're going to celebrate Jesus' birthday, and remember that Jesus only received three gifts, okay? So don't be disappointed with what lies under the tree. That's actually a really good concept, right? When it came time for worship on Christmas morning, he'd ask the children what they thought Jesus would think of Santa and all this hype that goes around Christmas now. Would he ask Santa a question? The father asked the children. And the youngest daughter replied, I think Jesus would ask Santa, how come I only got three gifts? And none of them were toys. <laughs> I guess Santa even disappointed Jesus, apparently. But Jesus is king. He is king. And he has given us every good benefit. The things that really matter in our lives. Look at your neighbor and tell them, really matter. He doesn't give us just the toys and the amenities and those comfortable things that we enjoy in life. But he provides the real stuff that really matters in our lives. So some of you are thinking right now, if Jesus is king, why is this world so messed up? Why is evil everywhere and injustice and sin? Great question. I'm glad you asked. There is victory over sin, evil, and everything that can come against you right now. Right now, through Jesus Christ. We can receive individual freedom, peace, joy, love, and all of us, many of us, have experienced this in Christ if our life has been surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. See, <clears throat> through Christ, we have power over sin, and evil is powerless over us. But the problem is the world still rejects him. You can't fight a spiritual war with physical weapons. The problem with the world is not a lack of freedom, money, uh, provision, unity, love, although all of these things are very important. The problem with the world is this, it stems from the human heart. The human heart. You can't change someone's heart. They must be willing to give their life to God and surrender to his lordship. Since the fall of man, the whole world, the Bible says, has been groaning for peace, justice, and a righteous ruler a, and righteousness here on the earth. Sin entered through Adam, but God has a plan to restore order, justice.
justice and bring judgment. The Bible promises that Jesus will come back to reveal himself once and for all. And this is what we're talking about, the crown. He will establish his kingdom, and there will be no doubt that he is in charge. The world has waited, waited for over 2,000 years for the Messiah to come the first time. How long will we wait for the second return? Can I tell you? I don't think it matters. Does it really matter? Whether you are alive today to see his return, or whether you pass on and go to be with him, it doesn't matter. Either way, you're with him. If your lordship is to him, if he has lordship over your life, it's going to happen either way. Listen, if the word of God tells us specifically how, when, where, and why the first coming of Jesus happened, and it actually did happen, right? With many details, over 300 prophecies, I think we can be pretty secure in believing that the 500 plus scriptures of the second coming will happen. It's going to happen. Jesus promised at this time the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with great, with power and great glory. That's in Matthew 24. And look at Revelation 19 proclaims this about the second coming. It says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. That's the name above all names. The name above all names. Those who witnessed Christ's ascension into heaven after his death and resurrection were told by the angels. What did the angels tell them? Does anybody know? Why are you looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way that you have seen him go to heaven. The second coming will come at a time when the world is in most need for a righteous king. Revelation 6 to 18 describes the end times prior to the second coming. And the world will be devastated. Millions of people are going to perish. And the most evil person in all of history will be the ruler of the entire world. The second coming of Christ will put an end to all of that. And Revelation uh, chapter 19 says that on his robe and on his thigh, when he comes out of heaven, will be the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Listen, a lot of people, well, let me just say this. You know why I believe that we're getting close to the second coming of Jesus, to seeing him with the crown? Not just because the world is a place um, where we're seeing scripture fulfilled constantly. You're seeing things happen today that you never, ever saw years ago. Not just because of that, or because you look around you and you see the world's getting rough and things are going bad and all these things. I believe that we're getting close because no one's talking about it anymore. Nobody talks about it anymore. Nobody preaches on it. When's the last time you talked to your friend and encouraged your friend about the second coming? Nobody speaks of this anymore, even though it's a major doctrine uh, woven throughout scripture. And think about this. Before Jesus came the first time, between Malachi and Matthew is considered 400 years of silence. Nothing. Nobody was talking about it anymore much. I mean, they all were hoping for this Messiah. The prophecies were there. But it was, it was as if we're going to be here forever. This is our life. Everybody lived their life day to day as if nothing was coming. There was no expectation. And can I tell you, we're in the same place today. There's no expectation of the second coming. There's people not looking for it or seeing that it could be any day and at any moment. You know, I think that that's a sign to us because the Bible is constantly saying in the end times for Christians to watch and pray. Watch for what? For his coming. He could be coming. 
There's a, a shirt I saw the other day of Santa Claus, and it says, picture of Santa, it says, I still believe. I'm going to create a new shirt. I'm going to create a t-shirt with a rider on a white horse <laughs> with blazing eyes of fire. And on the bottom, it's going to say, I still believe. Because I believe it. I believe it. Wouldn't that be an awesome witnessing shirt? They say, I still believe. And what? You know? That would be great. Listen, don't lose heart, my friend. Jesus is king, and he will make all things right. When you look around you and you see chaos, you see immorality, you see things falling apart, remember, either he will return while you're still alive, or you will go to be with him before he does. Either way, you are promised the security of salvation and being with him. Christmas is about remembering the promise of the first coming, and this gives us hope of his second coming, his second coming. The cradle leads through the cross to the crown, folks. There is no reason for the cradle without the hope of the crown, and Christ is faithful, and he will accomplish what he said. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together today. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I want to. I want you tonight, uh, today, to consider two things as we leave here today. First thing I want you to consider is that if you've been a Christian for 10, 20, 30 years, like myself, I've been a believer in Christ for over 30 years now. I want today, this Christmas season, let's renew our hope in the second coming of Jesus. Can we do that? Let's renew our hope in the second coming. We don't talk about it like we should. We don't pray for it like we should. We don't look for it. We don't wait in anticipation for it like we were meant to. The early Christians, every day they're looking for They live their life with eternity in mind constantly. And when you live like that, it bleeds into every decision that you make. It bleeds into even, it, it, it influences your attitude, your mindset, everything that you do. We live as if sometimes this world is all we have. You know, collecting our stuff, collecting our trophies. When the Bible says that we are aliens and strangers in this world. We are to live as if Christ could return at any moment. And God wants that for us, folks. He has won the war for us. He has won it. And this week, during this Christmas season, I want you to intentionally encourage. First Corinthians, or First Thessalonians tells us to encourage one another with the hope of the second coming. So I want you to intentionally turn to your family, your friends. If you hear them down or complaining or saying, you say, hey, you know what? Jesus is coming. Jesus is king. He is here. He is coming for us. And your troubles will mean much less to you in the light of what our future holds, folks. The second thing is that this Christmas, if you haven't already, make Jesus Lord of your life. Make him Lord. The Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's going to happen one way or the other. Let's do it willingly. Let's do it willingly. And can I tell you something? There's no better decision that you could possibly make with your life. No better decision. And if he is faithful with controlling the destiny of the entire world, I am positive he can handle your life. <laughs> I'm positive of that. Peter, um, Peter Fostrith, he was a Scottish theologian. I read this quote the other day, and I thought this is so true. The first duty of every soul is not to find its freedom, but its master. What will you surrender your life to? Some of us surrender our, our life to money, to work, to relationships, to career, to dreams. You know, and these are all good and noble pursuits. But what will you surrender your life to? I encourage you to surrender it to Jesus. Because when you surrender to Christ, then and only then 
Will you have the freedom that you long for? Will you have the peace and the joy and the love? All those other things, they don't fill. They don't fill at all. It just leaves you wanting more. But when you surrender to your creator, to Jesus Christ, then you're filled. You are complete. So let's pray today. I actually, I asked the worship team. We hope you enjoyed this message today. If you're ever in the Boston area, please feel free to visit us at Victory Church. We'd love to have you as our guest. And if you need prayer today, you can go to our website and we will pray for you. Go ahead and submit your request online. And we have prayer partners that pray for those requests on a weekly basis. Thanks for visiting.